Welcome to everybody. I'm Paul Massey, the CEO of B6. It's, uh, I know we've got a bunch of friends uh, with us today here with my partner, DJ Johnston, and um, Maria D'Angelo, who's one of our sales directors, who will, um, who will kind of moderate us. But we want this to be about what you're interested in, what you want to hear about. So we're going to have a substantial um, Q&A session after a short fit, right, Deej? Yeah, let's let's try to keep it as interactive as possible. I think I think we enjoyed that more, and I'm sure you do as well. So, Maria, why don't we just dive right in? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Today, we are going to review our third quarter market data, trends, and predictions for the year ahead. And as they mentioned, open up the end of our discussion for Q and A. So, Paul, I'm going to direct the first question to you. So from 30,000 feet above, what is the data telling you from a historical perspective? This is a very fascinating time, gang, because we're, we've gone through, seems like past tense, I'm using that word, um, a, a historically low volume um, point in times in terms of number of buildings that are selling. Uh, citywide, you have about 3,000 buildings that sell on average every year. Um, but if you look back to um, and these are multifamily buildings. If you look back to the Great Recession, 08, 09, that was um, one of the lowest points in terms of volume. What happens when, um, you know, there are radical external changes is pe people freeze up. So they don't do anything. Uh, but you see the market came back and the market peaked um, when there was a threat in January of 2013 of capital gains increases. The next big hump in the middle of EEC is another point in time where people were afraid of increased capital gains. Um, and then you see us more moving towards the right to the present day where we see what the uh, ramifications of rent regulation uh, from the state was in 2019. You see a precipitous drop in the sale of multifamily buildings because people didn't know what was going on. They, you know, All of a sudden you couldn't raise rents, all of a sudden you couldn't um, fix up your buildings and, and pass through the increase in rents to the tenant. And we hit rock bottom in um, the third quarter of 2020, which re really shows the effects of um, the pandemic on the market where things, we thought things were frozen up in 2019, but they get to freeze up even a little bit more. So I think we're on the way through that. I think people have um, gotten their head around and built into the market the rent regulations, I think we're driving out of the pandemic time, which, um, you know, there've been a bunch of pandemics in New York, one in every century. And each time the pandemic ended, there was a period of relief, euphoria. I think we're heading into that now. I think we're feeling it around um, our company. The, um, the office is very upbeat, transaction volumes increasing. Um, people are feeling great. Um, but I think there are some things to think about, some trends to watch, and um, I think we, we have some definitive predictions about where we think the market's going for multifamily and, and commercial across the board in the city. So, yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, Paul. So now, DJ, can you speak to what our data shows from a transaction volume and a dollar volume standpoint? Yeah, sure. It's nothing like talking data at nine o'clock on a Monday morning, <laughs> but um Something, something we're a little bit obsessed with here. Um, I think, I think the first thing we want to know uh, is transaction volume. Um, you know, we're looking at about 1,700 transactions through the end of this year. Um, you know, which um, is probably about 20% below kind of where we want to be. But this quarter, we're tracking um, about 500 transactions for the fourth quarter, right? And historically, you know, I'd say the 20-year average or 10-year average is. is is around 550, right? So I think things are moving in the right direction and we're, we're, we're clearly seeing that from a, a transaction standpoint. Um, DJ, you know, and, if, I can jump, if I can jump in for a second, that graph yeah. looks so, that looks so smooth and so benign. And I, I think it, it, it's uh, Let's, being a little pull critical. It up again, of, yeah, being a little critical of ourselves here. I mean, if you go from 2009 where you have got 700 transactions, to a high point of 2015 with 2,800, and now we're back down to 1,400 and 1,600 on an annualized basis. That's a radical shift in volume. 
So I think what you're looking at here is a little misleading in the sense that it looks like a nice smooth transaction history. But if you have um, 3,000 trades in a year and we're at half speed, that, that tells me that we're probably going to drive out of this and velocity is going to increase. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, and, and if, you, if, you, if you don't mind, Maria, pulling up the, uh, the dollar volume slide. Um, I think I think when you're looking at those transaction volumes, you know, a lot of that is, is, is smaller multifamily too, right? So that that may actually be a little bit light light on the transaction volume standpoint because we don't track four and five families. And I think I think it was pretty clear that post rent law change, there was a big shift away from rent regulated product into into free market product, which would be the fours and five. So again, like to Paul's point, I, I think that chart shows that we've got a lot of growth ahead of us, but we're moving in the right direction. Um, from, from a dollar volume standpoint, um, you know, we are not, you know, we're just not seeing, or at least this year, we haven't seen the big ticket items trade, right? So, um, you know, we're tracking around $17 uh, billion, excuse me, million, billion dollars worth of um, transaction volume um, in 2021, uh, which again, is just shy of what we saw last year, uh, despite the first quarter of last year having a little bit more um, uh, dollar volume than, than what we've seen in the last three quarters of this year. Um, but, you know, I think more, more importantly is not just tracking how much dollar volume, but what type of trends or what type of transactions are taking place. Um, you know, you, you saw a lot of distressed, uh, hotel active, um, uh, a lot of distressed, uh, hotel transactions take place. Uh, we saw the start city affordable housing, uh, project take place. Uh, and, you know, obviously Google, um, is announcing their headquarters, um, um, on the West side. So, excuse me, downtown. So, um, you know, what that shows is, is that you've got, you know, tech giant as an end user that's transacting, you're seeing affordable housing trade, um, but we're really expecting next year, um, the, the traditional office and retail and, and hotel transactions start to take place. Um, so again, this is what we kind of want to see and what we expect to see coming out of the, a correction cycle. Um, you know, typically you see your multifamily deals trade first, you know, followed by your mixed use, your development, your office, your retail. Um, everything from a data standpoint tends to be pointing in that direction. So uh, to Paul's point, um, we anticipate this really to start picking up, you know, first quarter of next year. Thank you both. Uh, now we're going to move on to trends. So Paul, this question's for you. Are there certain trends that you're seeing in our current market that you can relate to previous cycles? Yeah, I think I was alluding to it before where, um, you know, the way people react to recessions or external economic impact this was this was kind of like the combo the combo of rent regulation and the pandemic were very similar i think to a recession uh the prior recessions that we've experienced where you see um traffic slow down people freeze up wondering what's going to happen they don't want to sell into a sliding um uh market in terms of pricing. So what, what's interesting to me is this was um, the first time citywide where we saw uh, prices per pound, average price of, of a building um, go down 15 to 20% roughly. Um, even in the prior recessions, you'd have slow traffic, but the best stuff would sell. So prices wouldn't go down. We, we had a real correction in terms of value and we had a correction in terms of volume um, heading down. So one of the reasons we're optimistic about um, the future, and that's for brokers, for investors um, looking for opportunity, is that people only sell their building once every 39 years in New York City. It's very, very interesting. The tax structure really makes it prohibitive to sell. If you look historically, assets appreciate, so you're way better off just never selling. So you, you refinance every four or five years, take a little extra money out. That's what most people do, right? So the people who end up selling are doing it for less than pure economic trading activity, um, motive, motivations than they are life's moving on. They've decided they're going to retire. They're going to pay their taxes. They're probably not going to 1031 if they're a private client in New York. They might have an estate to settle. They may have a partnership that needs to wind up. Whatever that motivation is, um, 
it, it goes beyond economics, it, it's personal. So what we have seen and what we have seen in prior downturns is that people put life on hold and life can't be on hold forever. So there are a whole universe of people. It was, if it was 3000 in an average year, there are 1500 people out there who, who punted into next year where they're probably gonna transact or some number of them are gonna transact. So we're super optimistic about value stabilizing and people trading more frequently. So you're gonna see a, probably a significant uptick on the way to 3000 trades a year this year. So that does spell opportunity for every broker out there. It spells opportunity for every investor out there who've been product starved for the past two years. So that I see a trend of volume increasing and I see returning to a healthy market. And that I'll say that across the board. I mean, I thought the retail market um, had bottomed out prior to the pandemic, but boy, did it take another hitch. Um, I don't, I can't imagine how the retail world is not at the bottom right now. And I think a lot of people are looking at that, especially high street retail, um, you know, Madison Avenue, West Broadway, um, the, the hot, um, stable markets of uh, prior years are going to be uh, coming back and stabilizing. And I think, uh, I think that spells big opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So DJ, are there certain factors that are contributing to mm -hmm. the success of transactions today that you may or may not have seen in previous cycles? Yeah, so I, you know, like, I was frankly surprised that transaction volume wasn't reporting higher, you know, because we're, we're absolutely feeling it in our pipeline. You know, I think B6 has about 65 multifamily listings, a lot of which have gone into contracts in the last 60 days. Right. So we're feeling the um, the, the effects of the market before I think the data can report on it. Um, so that's given us a real kind of uh, a clear outlook on, on transaction volume, particularly over the next quarter. Um, but I think the question and, and the, the, the trend that, um, has become obvious is, is buyers and sellers are finding a way to, to meet in the middle, right? So, um, you know, the, the, um, we're kind of, um, you know, the tires hitting the road and we're finding ways to transact and it's kind of a compromise between buyers and sellers. And there's reasons for that, right? There's reasons why we're able to meet in the middle. One is to pause point, right? We're almost three years into the rent law changes. So life decisions need to happen. Right. People need to retire. People need to move on. People are getting a little bit tired on, on you know, having to manage these properties as, as, um, as, as, um, as difficult as they are to manage. Um, and funds need to close. Right. So, you know, a lot of these value add funds have, you know, a three to five year kind of horizon. And we're coming to a point where a lot of those funds are deciding to redeploy their equity. Right. So there's, there's motivations on both sides of the table. Um, secondly, there's been a lot of talk this year about tax reform. Um, and whenever that becomes uh, uh, a subject, um, sellers really start to consider transacting in, within the calendar year. And uh, you know, we've certainly seen that motivation in the last six months. It doesn't seem like it's going to be as bad as maybe we had early predicted, but just the thought of tax reform, I think, gets people focused on selling. Um, I know when, in, in, when we were at Massey Nackle in 2012, I think, you know, the market saw 850 transactions in that, in that fourth quarter. Um, our, our CFO at the time, I think, aged 10 years that December because Massey Nackle had like 100 transactions in, in December. So That's a good way to age. That's a good way to age. I'll take that. Um, but it just, it just shows the, the implications of, of, this tax, of these tax changes. Um, you know, and then thirdly, and I, I think where, where we're seeing kind of the most um, change is in the is in the rental market, right? So, um, you know, investors were a little hesitant. They were they were looking at twenty percent vacancies, and they were having a hard time bidding with confidence. And we've been really surprised on how quickly the rental market has rebounded. Um, you know, in August we were reporting about five percent median ask uh, five percent below pre COVID levels from a median rent asking point. We're now five percent above. Um, you know, so we we are we are beyond pre-pandemic rental levels. And I think that's giving, and, I, and frankly, there's no, there's no end in sight. I, I think that's going to continue to happen. And I think investors are, are starting to get confident. They're starting to get comfortable that they can bid into a growing rental environment. 
Um, and that's allowing them to drop their cap rates, you know, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points. And that's allowing us as brokers to, to kind of squeeze the market and, and find the middle ground. So um, again, all, all good signs. And I think, um, you know, bode well for, for next year. So Paul, can you speak to any interesting new trends that you're seeing in our current market? Yeah, so hmm, I think the big one is probably uh, the potential for inflation. I think people are talking a lot about that. I think people are uh, saying, well, maybe inflation will cause a flight to real estate, you know, a flight to hard assets that, that would appreciate with the inflationary market. I think that's, you know, long-term big picture correct, but short-term Inflation will have a chilling impact on uh, the debt market um, as it starts to increase. That that will probably, in the short term, affect pricing or pressure downward on pricing a little bit. I remember when I was um, in college, I had a job in a savings bank on Federal Street in Boston. And I remember walking in the front door of the bank one day, and they were offering twenty one percent six month CDs and I think at that moment, the inflation rate was 16, 17% um, nationally. So there are periods and they, they come and they go. Of, we haven't seen one in a long time and there, there's not a lot of memory out there for this, but um, there are periods where there's um, um, inflation on a great scale and it, it, it's a cold bucket of water on the market short term, long term, yes. Um, there'll be a flight to hard assets and people who have held on to their real estate will be super happy that they did. Um, but, you know, when you see gasoline prices spiking, when you see uh, supply shortages, I, uh, it, it's, it, it's very interesting what's happening now. And I, I think it has a potential to continue a bit. So we need to keep an eye on that and watch how that affects, uh, you know, our fundamental real estate market. Yeah, just to, to add on to the inflation point, you know, we're at 6.1% annualized this year. Um, we haven't seen that since 1990. I was in the second grade. I, I asked Paul all the time, like, tell me about inflation. You know, it's, 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 I don't think these markets have really seen this yet, right? So it's kind of, um, it's, it's becoming a little bit clearer to me, right? Because, um, you know, landlords, if, if you look at inflation and how it's broken up, uh, you know, to Paul's point, you talk about, you know, gas and oil, right? Oil's up 59%. That, that, that's, that's, you know, critical when you're operating the building. Uh, utility gas is up 28%, right? So it may, it may look like 6%, but to a real estate owner, it could be drastically different. And if we're not taking that into consideration, when we're looking at our rent increases, right? When we're looking at where interest rates are going, um, you know, th this is a real burdensome on real estate owners. And it's something that we got to, we got to keep it, you know, and, you know, a lot of people are reporting that this is going to sober out and that it's going to, you know, hopefully settle to, you know, two, 3%, which is where, you know, historically a building can, can operate. But, um, you know, I'm worried about, you know, the cost within building management and the fact that we've seen a real spike and don't have the ability to, to increase rents. Um, if this does create um, an increase in, uh, in interest rates, I, I think that that could have downward mobility or excuse me, it could have a downward uh, effect on pricing for rent stabilized products, but it could also um, potentially create an opportunity for maybe free market product, right? And that's where we're seeing a lot of our demand right now is, is for uh, buildings that were built, I would say in the last three years that get to benefit from a 35 year tax abatement. They're free, they're free market, you know, electric and utilities are transferred to the tenants. Um, and they're incredibly financeable, right? So if, it, if inflation goes up and, and, and interest rates go up, um, people may move away from home ownership, go back into the, into the rental market. Um, and that can create a real pop actually in, in free market rents, which you know, could work well for these buildings that are predominantly free market and ultimately have fixed expenses. So I think that's the trend we're seeing from an asset type is that there's an enormous amount of demand for free market, newly developed properties with tax abatements. You're eliminating a lot of the risk that we're seeing in today's market. Thank you both for your insights. So DJ, starting with you, what trends do you predict that we will see through the remainder of the year and the quarter and year ahead? Um, 
again, I, I think I think free market rents are going to continue to rise. I think I think we're we're they're they're going up dramatically. You know, I, I think that's just um, a function of of um, you know diminishing housing stock. And I, I know Paul's been been pushing this agenda for 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 a long time about we need to build more uh, infrastructure, more buildings. I think in 2020 there are only 1,800. Uh, new permits filed for uh, in Manhattan, right? Which is 65% less than there was in, in, in two, uh, 2019. So I think we've got a real um, uh, supply issue. And, um, you know, I think that's not necessarily good for New York in general. I think it can be beneficial if you own free market buildings with low tax basis and you can control your tax exposure and your rents are going to, you know, likely go up. Um, but I'm not so sure it's, it, it, um, it uh, puts us in a position where we feel like we're a healthy real estate market. So, you know, Paul, I know, I know you, you're, you, you're, um, you know, you've got real concerns about building stock and how we can address that. But I, I think that's a real issue. And I, and I think that's something we've got to keep an eye on. Yeah, so DJ probably remembers last week I was railing at one of our sales meetings about universal rent control and how, if you think about it, if there is a universal rent control, um, how is it operative? And I, I told the gang I was going to focus on an op-ed about how, how are the court system going to handle all the massive dislocation, disputes, regulation, uncharted law around something like that, where, you know, I, I, the intention to help folks who are struggling is good. Um, but how is it operative? And the, and the gang in the office, the, you know, the, the, the 40 agents sitting around the table, but like, Paul, I think you're, you're coming at this from the wrong angle. No one's going to care about how it's operative. And, and the, uh, the real thing is, you know, what policy can be put in place that mitigates the need for universal rent control? And, and they suggested, uh, I think correctly, uh, policy that's going to spur on supply because if you've got you've got a family of four living in a, an apartment in New York and the kids are getting to the age where they want to graduate from school and move out you know they're facing a market now that's back to its old healthy self or where we've got you know it's very little vacancy somewhere between three and four percent and if you put in place um, some type of universal rent control you're going to drive supply down below 1%. So again, it's just totally clogging up the market. So I think we need to put in place um, policy that will make us incent us to build more housing. And I think um, some of our smartest clients, the clients who are diving into the regulated market now, know, I think correctly, that we need to adjust the rent regulation laws. Oh, I think we lost Paul. Don't worry, everybody. He's he's okay. I'm sure he'll jump on any second. But um, you know, like to you know, Paul will finish his point in a second. But um, you know, two things that he reminded me of that I, I think we want to just stay in front of, and, and two dates that you should maybe remember. One is January 15th, right? That's when the uh, eviction moratorium expires, right? So there's a lot of um, back rent, um, excuse me, you know, uh, rental aid out there that needs to be deployed. Um, so keep an eye on that date, uh, January 15th for that, because there's going to have obviously some market implications there. And then the, the other date that I would keep in mind is June 15th. That's when they're, um, the, the current uh, new development abatement expires, right? So there's huge implications talking about building stock on you know, how we approach that abatement. Um, it's effectively impossible to develop new product without the abatement, um, just because they put such a heavy emphasis on tax exposure. Um, so you're either going to get taxed 30%, or, or your taxes are ultimately going to get frozen. And considering where uh, construction costs are today, uh, it's imperative that we that we that we um, address that abatement properly. Um, my hope is that they uh, keep the abatement yeah, as is. I, I think go. I'm back. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. You want to finish your thought on on building supply? No, I was just saying that uh, I think that's the answer. I think we've got a very old housing stock. We've got population definitively growing. We need, we need a million new units. And um, it's, uh, you know, if you, if you think about the population increases and you think about the 2.4 person per family um, 
math, we need 400,000 units right there. And then if you think about housing stock that needs upgrade or rebuild or reboot, um, it, it's hundreds of thousands of units. So we need, we need uh, policy, but we need the policy to be widespread, not, not, not focused like the prior uh, administration, mayoral administration was where everything was a one-off negotiation. That just should, you know, makes the market so, so difficult. And I, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. Yes, I, I read somewhere that you know since the recession we've, we've created around eight hundred thousand new jobs, but only two hundred thousand new units uh, over the last ten years. So like that, that's clearly something that, that needs to be addressed, and and, and uh, providing more supply is really the only answer, in, in my opinion. And, uh, going back to my point before, the, the 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 abatement is crucial, and it's something to make your voice known about, and, and really um, you know try try to. Um, Try to you know be a voice of reason on how important these abatements are for developers to to, to build new stock uh, within New York City. Um, you know, and, and Maria, I think I think, think how exciting it would be, DJ. Oh, sorry. Think how exciting right. it would be if the mayor and the governor got ahead of the 421A and 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 pushed it ahead well in advance of the expiration date. Home run. That would yeah. that would be such an uplifting signal to the market. That, that's the message. I, I think we need to be addressing it now. We can't wait till the day it arrives or potentially six months later, like we have in previous, you know, uh, voting rounds. So um, we, we should, you know, we should be asking for that information now because we've, we've got owners of land who are, are holding off selling because they just don't know. And developers are sitting in the mud because they just don't get how they can underwrite a deal without knowing what the abatements are going to look like. So you know, it is a crucial time in the next six months to get buildings out of the ground. And, um, you know, we, we can't make decisions without, without knowing what the abatements are going to look like. Um, you know, Paul, there's an interesting slide in our report that speaks to like cap rate, um, the risk premium, you know, the relationship to, from cap rates to uh, the 10-year treasury. Do you, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because I think that's kind of an interesting uh, relationship. Yeah, jump, no, jump in, go for it. Yep. Yeah, so... I, I like this. this. This makes me feel optimistic because, you know, I'm talking to a lot of clients that are like, you know, you know DJ, I can buy a five cap in, in Brooklyn. And, you know, I'm looking at other markets right now because there's perceived upside, but I'm buying into these markets at a three and a half, four cap, right? So there's, there, there's opportunity in New York, I think, because you've got cap rates that are floating around a five cap and you've got the 10 year treasury that's 400 basis points below that. Right. So I think, I think that is, um, a real opportunity, particularly as the market um, starts gaining its confidence back and it's perceived as being less risky. But I could, I could really foresee cap rates compressing, assuming that interest rates stay where they are. Um, I can see cap rates compressing next year. Um, so if you have this, um, you know, this environment where your your rental income is increasing because of supply issues and cap rates coming down, I mean, it's a real opportunity as a seller to, you know, look at your assets, um, you know. Prepare for the next six months. You know, be ready, but follow the data and follow. You know, follow where things are trading because, um, I, you know, given where this premium is and given the confidence coming into the market, I think I think there could be some compression there. Um, should we um, uh, have Q and A for a bit? Yeah, I'd really like cool. to hear from our friends who are with us. Mm -hmm. We actually have one question right now. Maybe there should be some more questions coming in, but John Markles. Do you expect many office buildings and hotels to be converted to rentals or condos despite various obstacles? No. Um, I think the, first of all, on a, from an overarching perspective, I think the work from home thing is a complete bad that's going to evaporate this year. I, I don't see how, you know, it, what, who was it? Larry Fink from BlackRock's quoted as saying, this is a career ending event for millennials. I think, um, especially the young folks uh, should get back to work. Should should they're, they're, they're missing out on all that you learn uh, through osmosis and directly mentoring, coaching, um, su benevolent supervision, all of the above. And I think um, I think people are going to wake up and very quickly realize they need to be together, especially like a services business. You know, we're we're largely open in our office, obviously respecting um hybrid for those who 
who need it, who've got family circumstance, whatever. But like we're back. We've been back since July of uh, 2020. And I think um, services businesses need that. So I think that the whole discussion where, where it's interesting, it's a plan B for office space for conversion to residential or hotel um, is a sensible idea. I don't think it's ever going to get a chance to happen. All right, Paul, thank you. Uh, DJ, do you want to say anything to it or? No, I, you know, like it was interesting. We saw a couple of distressed hotels uh, change hands the last 12 months, um, a couple with the plans of converting the condo. Um, but I think that was a, you know, given where rents are bouncing back, I think it was a short lived. I think, I think these, I think these operators and, and, and owners are going to be able to survive the next six months and regain their, their kind of the rental confidence. So um, whether it's, uh, you know, hotel or office, I think the, the rents are coming back and it's going to be just in time to ensure that they can kind of get their, their business back back up and running. And we're absolutely um, seeing an uptick in, in office presence at B6. All my friends that are in finance that were kind of sitting sitting casual at home, um, you know, over the summer are back in the office. All my friends and, and family are back in the office. So, you know, both professionally and, and personally, I'm seeing that trend happen. And um, I think it's forced us to reevaluate, you know, how, how we work and what's important to us. And I think that's great. But if, if you prioritize being effective at your job, I think being, being in the office is, is, a, is a must. And um, for anyone that knows how we function, I, I literally sit back to back with Paul Massey. And, you know, what an advantage for me to have him, you know, four feet from my desk. Um, so politically, I think from, an, from, a, from a career growth standpoint, um, it's just imperative that, that people are you know, start going getting back to the office. It's great to have Paul, of course. Whenever I yeah. had a question, I always emailed him. He gave me the answer. <laughs> I just it's yelled very, at the very... computer. <laughs> oh yeah, Brad, Brad Molesky. Uh, given the forthness of the MF markets, are you seeing continued interest in MF development and opportunity zone in the U.S.? Has it uh, has it? Um, has to be a good deal, of course, but the OZ benefits of deferral reduction and elimination of capital gains. Are you seeing more deals in this space? Yeah, I would, I would say 80% of the development deals that I've done in the last 12 months have been opportunity zone deals. And they're not massive funds. These are, these are small developers that are 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 buildable square feet. Um, but that was the real angle of the last 12 months is, is to be competitive on pricing was to take advantage of the opportunity zone. So, um, you know, that window is getting is, is obviously um, shortening, um, but there's still demand out there from, from opportunity zone investors. And frankly, it's kept the, the land market, um, you know, relatively busy um, that in New York. And it sounds like this question is also kind of directed to the, the greater kind of the, the national market. But. In New York, the tax abatements are bar none the most important element of underwriting a, underwriting a, a development deal. So, you know, that's been, even though the, the multifamily market is recovering, we're too close to the expiration of the abatement for developers to confidently bid. So we're still seeing a sluggish multifamily land market despite rental rates really, really pushing up. Now there's some condo guys that are less affected by the, the, um, the, the, the abatement, um, environment um, but even they can't get financing on a condo project without having to fall back into rental so you know the condo guys do, are do have an edge up right now um, but um, again it, there is they're still lacking confidence without having the baby in place thank you dj we have a question where do you see the delta investors are seeking for yield on costs for new developments substantial rehabs and exit cap rates let me try to understand that question a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> try lay that one on us again. Okay. Where do you see the Delta investors? I guess the uh, Delta variants of investors, I guess, are, are seeking cost. for yield on the cost for new developments, substantial rehabs, and exit cap gotcha. rates. Sure. So if exit cap rates, you know, we pretty generically assume a five cap, you know, that's where the market just tends to be right now. They, they, they're going to, you know, better, better product. They're probably four, seven, five, maybe four and a half. But I would say that in general, 
um, exit caps. Um, if you were to fit, you know, build a project and finish, um, you're looking at about a five cap um, is, is where they're performing. Um, that that tends to um, yield a six and a half percent, you know, return on cost, right? So there's about a 150 basis point difference between maybe an exit cap and what you're ultimately building into. Um, that tends to relate to about a 20, 25% return on your equity during the development period, right? So, you know, a lot of developers will, will put a seven, you know, 7% or seven and a half percent on, 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 you know, on their construction, but they're, you know, like we're always optimistic when we're putting in a performer. Um, you know, I, I think we have, you know, what, once things are delivered, um, I think six and a half percent, uh, you know, cost is, you know, return on cost is, is the right metrics. Great. Thank you. Did you and again, I, I just to preface that I, I, I specialize in Brooklyn. I've got a lot of outer borough experience. So, you know, that, that tends to be the development sites that I have the most exposure towards. So, you know, obviously that's going to change if you're looking at Manhattan product or condo product, but, you know, I would say the, the, the bread and butter, which is kind of a middle market development, you know, that that's, that's the type of uh, expectations we have. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Roy. What laws would you propose adding or subtracting to increase flexibility in property development and use? I think the, um, the hotel room um, legislation that's in place, the required permits, special permits, is just you know unnecessarily meddling with a market that uh, needs to come back anyway from the pandemic effects. So I think uh, there was a question earlier about uh, conversion to hotel. I think that hotel market will substantially come back this year, but we need to just leave it alone and let it be and let, let these hotels get back on their feet. So um, restricting further hotel development, probably unnecessary in the current climate. Um, again, getting back to the rent regulation laws, I'd loosen them up and let people start to uh, increase rents. If, if it needs to be modestly at first, that, that makes sense, uh, might make sense. But um, the one thing that um, probably uh, uh, the, the newer politicians, the new, the new wave that are coming in are realizing is that about half the city's revenue comes from directly from real estate taxes on the properties we're discussing. So what you've done is um, probably significantly decrease their assessed value um, and therefore you've eroded your tax base. So I think there could be substantial budget shortfalls for the city in the next few years, um, which will be substantial. And if you think about who the regs were trying to help, which is folks who are struggling, um, the first thing the city and the, and the only real variability the city budget has is around social programs. So again, you're inadvertently hurting folks you really wanna help. So the, the overarching answer is let's get back to the, the big point we're making, which is let's create a lot of housing and that will take pressure off rents. People will be able to um, uh, live and you know again we don't need a barbell society where it's a bunch of rich folks and a bunch of folks who are struggling we need we need new york to be a real community for everybody so um I, I, again um let's let's throttle back on all this rent regulation so that we can return to uh you know some uh, a substantial or, or, or a stable market i should say yeah, thank you paul Yep. One thing that I, you know, the certificate of non-harassment pilot program is, is super concerning in, 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 in areas um, like Brooklyn and like Northern Manhattan. Um, you know, you, it requires you to take about 12 months to get approvals to do, to get a permit, right? So, you know, timing is everything to investors and uh, whether it be the DOB or whether it be this pilot program, I mean, you know, there needs to be a responsiveness to getting permits approved and getting um, getting your utilities, uh, you know, um, up and running. I mean, it's time. Time is killer. And every developer I talk to, every investor I talk to, it's just, you know, everything's taking twice as long as it as it should. And I think that's just because there's too much government government oversight 
um, on the wrong things. You know, I, I think I think in, you know investors and developers have to be accountable, but I think the rules need to be need to be clear, and there needs to be a um, um, an avenue to completion that's a, a, a lot faster. I completely second that, and if you think about the real world, uh, investors and developers have banks, and banks need a pro forma that makes sense. And if there's uncertainty, radical uncertainty, if nothing else around timing, that makes the, the lending market more difficult. And many developers uh, raise equity. And again, the pro forma around the equity raise, if it's you know thrown into uncertainty because of uh, the city in terms of not having its act together at the DOB or around um, managing um, their own regulation, um, it, it just makes it very, very difficult for uh, operators and investors to create the housing that we want. Very true. We have a question from Eric. Does there seem to be any movement to ease rent laws in Albany, especially in regards to AIA? Any, any idea on how apartments have permanently left the market given that they are not in livable form? And does it pay to renovate them? Hey, Ark, what's going on? Um, almost every building that I'm selling that has a vacant rent stabilized unit is not occupied. And for two reasons. One, it just doesn't make financial sense to the, to the, to the landlord uh, to occupy the unit, or it's not in livable condition. So even if you wanted to rent, you couldn't, right? So it's, you're, you're at a real um, inflection point where you can either renovate spend 50 grand renovating a unit without the ability to increase your rent or, you know, attempt to do some sort of unit reconfiguration. And those rules are, are getting tighter and tighter, which is, which I think is problematic. Um, or you plan to do a substantial rehab at some point. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, politically, I don't think they're tracking who's living in the apartments. I just think they're tracking how many units are technically rent stabilized. Right. So I think that'd be something that'd be really interesting to, to look into is, you know, okay, we've, we've um, you know, essentially, you know, saved X amount of rent stabilized units, um, but how many are livable? How many are, are actually quality, quality units? And I think that would be a very sobering number. Um, I have not heard anything recently on changes to IAIs or, or, or um, MCIs, um, which is just, you know, it, it, um, it, it irritates us as, 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 um, you know, real estate advocates, because, you know, these buildings need to be managed and need to be, they need to be maintained. And, um, you know, an MCI seemed like a very simple, um, simple solution, right? You make improvements, the building shares very nominally, uh, shares in those building improvements. Um, IAIs are, you know, encouraging, you know, uh, private equity into these, into these units. You still protected rent stabilized unit, but I, I, I really hope that, um, as we move further and further away from the, the rent law changes and the evidence becomes more and more clear um, that um, cooler heads prevail. But, um, you know, we will look into maybe the, some data on, you know, rent stabilized units that, um, did, that did become vacant and how many are currently, uh, currently staying vacant. But I, I would imagine it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high ratio. Thanks, DJ. Uh, David Bowen, as a broker, you interface with capital lenders, banks, and other non-traditional pools of capital. What do you see happening in that landscape? I think the, uh, the universe of lenders is rapidly expanding, which is a great thing. I mean, it, it, lets, um, it, it lets there be a bigger menu of opportunities based on what, what your project needs in terms of um, you know, equity, a construction loan, a bridge loan, um, a loan that, uh, you know, a takeout loan for, for when you reach stability. So we love that um, there's so much money out there creatively chasing real estate. And the, uh, and, and that, that's a very healthy thing. I think that will be helpful also if you do see inflationary pressures, even if they're mild. Um, where the market will stay competitive. So we love the current market um, in terms of uh, debt opportunities and are seeing a lot of opportunities. We have a great crew 
at B6 who are helping our clients with um, their refinance needs, construction loan needs, and uh, it's a great business to be in. So um, we, uh, we see that market staying healthy. We were marketing a ground up uh, site in, in Greenpoint. Um, so it was uh, 27 units. Um, our second position bidder was, a, was basically a, um, a technology company out of Israel that was basically able to raise equity um, you know, um, at very small dollar amounts. So you, know, you can invest $50, $100, $150 into these uh, real estate investments. Um, and I think that's going to become very common too, where technology is allowing other, other uh, you know, people outside of your typical capital sources to invest in real estate. Um, I mean, don't get me started on cryptocurrencies. I don't know if we're, we're going to, I don't, I don't think we have enough time to get into that, but like there, there, there is something happening there that could, you know, bleed into real estate and whether it's, you know, blockchain contracts or, or fundraising, you know, techniques. Um, it's, it's something that I think is ultimately going to trickle down something we we're going to keep an eye on and maybe, maybe protects us from some sort of inflation and, um, but anyway, th those are kind of the more creative the whole, sources the, that we've seen. The whole crypto thing, Deej, sounds to me, it reminds me of my, my impression back in the day of when people started talking about this thing called the internet. And, you know, we all kind of knew there was something there, but we never really focused on it enough to really figure out all of what it might be. I think the crypto thing mm -hmm. has that opportunity. If you think about it, just on a simplistic level, how much it costs people to say, you know, how much it costs our immigrants to send money home. What, you know, just think of the percent cost and friction on their money um, to help folks who are struggling and to help folks who are trying to help um, their families back home, wherever that is. Um, the thought of crypto being frictionless and cost-free. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, floating, uh, with inflation and, and potentially increasing in asset value, um, I could see crypto contributing to a better world. So I, I, we're just starting, we're just starting to get an awareness of it, but it just smells to me like um, that, that massive thing that we, uh, you know, that we, we took a little while to figure out, you know, all that could be done with, um, you know, technology. So I think it's, this could be another, here we go. Very, very true. Very true. Um, how do you feel about the multifamily market in a non-prime locations of the outer boroughs? So well, that world's changing. Sorry, the, the, um, I mean, think, think about how, how easy it is to get around now between electric scooters and Ubers and um, all the things that have changed in the last few years. I'm not sure there is such a thing as non-prime in New York anymore. It's really, and, and DJ is, you know, one of our experts in this. So I'd love, love his opinion, but I love the way the world's working these days. Yeah. I think there's been a steady wave of rental increases, you know, kind of, if, if you imagine like the ripple effect coming out of, you know, primary areas and it's just a matter of time before, you know, the, the burgeoning areas start feeling what we're already feeling in better locations, the, the rental increases. And that, that's where that's what those markets need right now, I think, to have cap rates compressed because they, they're still sitting there with some collection issues and with some vacancy issues. Um, but New York is certainly getting smaller. Right. And, um, you know, Brooklyn is the third largest city in the United States. I mean, it's you know, like there there um, are sub neighborhoods that are absolutely taking off outside of just traditional fundamentals, which is access to Manhattan. Right. So. Um, you know, I think um, I, I think technology is, is certainly helping with that. Um, I just think that cap rates are still a bit hefty um, in kind of non-prime non areas. Um, but I think you're going to be fake, fa facing vacancy issues for the next six to 12 months that may compress that cap rate, you know. So um, it may look like on 100 percent, you know, occupied building that, you know, you're buying it at a six and a half, seven cap. But you're going to have to maybe get through the next uh, the next 12 months uh, to really see that stabilize. But but it's happening, and, and it's almost every you know, it's almost every month 
you know, it just seems to be getting that, that rental growth just seems to be expanding and expanding. So I, I feel good that, it, you know, essentially, at, you know, anywhere in New York at the right pricing is, is a good place to invest. And if you're an investor, if you think about there, the fact that south of 96th Street in Manhattan, there are about 24,000 buildings, people forget how massive a market like Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx are. There are 88,000 buildings in Brooklyn compared to the 24,000 in Manhattan. So think of the massive land area and it's less dense, right? So there are neighborhoods and submarkets that are right for uh, uptick in rents, uptick in occupancy, uptick in development. You know, I'd be really looking at uh, opportunities where you think you can get the land for a reasonable number in, um, you know, slightly non-Main Street locations around Brooklyn. It's, it's a big opportunity. Mm -hmm. Lucy Edwards, what about parking garage lot? Do you see conversion of the property in a different use? So developers hate parking, rightfully so. It, it is just, it costs a lot and it uh, doesn't deliver a yield and, and it, it sits vacant. So, um, you know, there, there's got to be a solution there. There's, there's some new tech companies that are focused around self-storage um, and effectively converting basement space, parking space uh, into, into private storage, um, which I think is a really interesting idea. The, the, the storage business in, in general lost their abatement um, when they were when they were voting on the budget bill for COVID, um, so there's very little new storage product being built right now. Um, so I think that really is an opportunity for a lot of these you know vacant commercial spaces uh, to be converted to storage, even basements. So you know people with you know 20 unit buildings that have these big basements that they don't want to duplex into, but it's big and it's dry and you've got high ceilings. I think there's going to be revenue stream there for you to take advantage of. Um, and um, you can reach out to us. I'll send you a couple uh, examples of these companies that are outsourcing this stuff. Great. Yeah, if, uh, you didn't, um, if, you, if, if you didn't see it, DJ's being proven exactly right with the $3 billion uh, Manhattan mini storage trade last week. I mean, that if, if that doesn't stamp, uh, uh, you know, signal huge value in the storage business, I don't, I don't know what could. So um, that, that was... A very, very telling transaction to me. Thanks, DJ. Um, you have this, you may have discussed this already. Do you foresee good cause eviction becoming a reality in New York City, given the trends in New York State, and that the fact there are some support in 2019? Is this perceived uh, risk having in the impact on the multifamily sales market? So, yeah, I think we did cover we did cover that, but go ahead, DJ. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's it was passed in Albany, it was passed in Hudson, New York. It was, you know, it's it was, you know, it's I think it was um Newburgh, it, it's in effect. Um, you know, the West Coast has seen a lot of this good cause eviction get getting passed. Um I think that um listen, I, I don't love when policy affects real estate values the way that these policies do, right? If they get a limit, it, 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 it limits an owner's ability to make private investments into the, into the real estate. Um, I, I think a lot of guys that are currently at market rents um, are not as concerned as maybe somebody who has, you know, a five family that is not renovated, has tenants in place, plans to renovate in the next two to three years, and ultimately couldn't if good cause eviction uh, go, goes goes into place. So um, again, I I think that it's um, it's too low hanging fruit for politicians to take advantage of. I think I think for the for kind of the the um, people outside of real estate that maybe don't understand the economics of real estate to the extent that we do, it's an easy thing to vote for, right? And then and so I I think my my expectation is that it likely will go into effect. I'm just hopeful that it's not going to limit you to two, 3% increases, maybe it gives you the flexibility of five, six, 7% like we've seen out in California. It could put owners in a real vice if you think about the conversation we had earlier about inflation and oil and mm -hmm. uh, operating costs, you know, combined with, um, you know, limitations on increases, it's gonna, it's, it, it could hurt. It could hurt. I think it's baked into the market though. 
we have a question from Mike. Have you ever acquired property through defaulted bank debt that you have purchased? <clears throat> we we are not active investors. We uh we love uh, operating our services business, and uh, so the answer is no. We uh we're funneling our money back into uh, building uh, a new fund business. Okay, and we have uh, what market trends do you uh, are you seeing in the co-op and general small multifamily sales sector of the Bronx? I think if you go to thirty thousand feet in the Bronx, um, you know, five years ago, six years ago, it was half price. I think we've we've got a young, uh, a couple of young stars, uh, Jared Friedman, Mitch Flaherty, who are operating and uh, serving that market for us, and. Mitch came from London and, and walked in our office for a job interview and said, I think the opportunities in the Bronx, I can see it all the way from London. And I think he was right. And I loved the fact that he was thinking so big picture. But if land was 125 bucks or 130 bucks a foot in Queens and Brooklyn, it was 50 bucks in the Bronx. I think that, that, that ship has sailed and that secret's out and every related and every Brookfield is up there. But it's a huge land area. Again, it's it's equal in size to Queens and Brooklyn, and therefore there are pockets and many neighborhoods there. Um, but the Bronx is great because it's got, um, even though it was, uh, you know, no offense, uh, a little bit of the stepchild. Um, it's got infrastructure. It's got transportation. It's got neighborhoods and communities, and um, and and it has institutions investing in it now. So. Um, Big, big place to be for the next few years. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I, and I'm sorry, just I, I'm a huge advocate for the Bronx. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I, I love the development opportunities. I love, I love the, the industrial opportunities. Um, you know, to, to the question regarding small multifamily, um, I, think, I think what's going to happen is you're seeing a lot of large scale affordable housing projects being built, right? With that is going to come more density. With that is going to come retail. With that is going to become a pop in free market rents. Um, you know, so I think that's when the, the smaller multifamily is really going to benefit. Um, and there's not a lot of smaller multifamily out there. A lot of it is larger kind of pre-war type building stock that's highly regulated. But um, the yields are great there. There's clearly a ton of investment happening in the Bronx. Um, all the fundamentals are solid. Um, it's absolutely a place. I, if I were an investor, I would pick my pocket and I would just deploy, deploy, deploy. Um, I'm a huge fan. Great. Very good. Um, one more question. We're going to finish it up with Paul. And this is a question from Showkit. Uh, and it was in the, in the chat room. Paul, uh, tell us about CMBS recovery. I think... Um... I think the CMBS market is healthy. I don't, um, I think there'll, there'll, there'll be some loans um, that special services will deal with that were affected you know, significantly by retail um, and maybe to some degree office, but, um, but, but those are being sorted through. I think the, you know, the old expression, um, a rising tide lifts all boats is, is kicking in there. So to the extent that institutions and special servicers have um, properties or loans that were stressed um, because of either rent regulation or the pandemic, I think it's I think it's sorting out kind of a little bit behind the scenes where you know companies like ours are helping people sell notes, stabilize notes, um, stabilize properties. So. Um, Again, we're, we're definitely on an upward trajectory and that'll help sort out um, any of the stress that had been occurring in the CMBS world. I think if you think about New York being a bubble, if you look at the national landscape or the health of the retail market, health of the office market, um, across the board, it's, it's a, there's a very healthy world out there. So on a, from a national 40,000 foot perspective, um, we're probably heading into a continued, um, you know, positive time. Um, thank you, Paul. Hey guys, this concludes our webinar with B6 Advisors. Um, like, as always, Paul, 
It's always an honor to have you and your firm on. Uh, DJ, I can see you as a rising star, man. You're great and uh, congrats. Maria, thank you so much for moderating. And uh, uh, so guys, we, I just wanna let, let everybody know that um, Maria will, will receive all the information, all the contact information. So if you wanna continue sending a question out to B6 and asking for advice, please, I welcome you to do that. She will also send out a thank you note to all of you that attended. I thank you so much, guys. You were fantastic. Thank you, Anthony, that was great. Thank you, yep. New York Real Estate Expo. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Maria. Thank, Thank you. you, DJ. Take care, everybody.